All right. Good morning, everyone. I am Caitlin Coleman. I work for Water Education Colorado, and I am here to moderate our first session of the morning. Um, I have a quick note for you from the conference organizers before we get started. So it says, Watersheds hasn't had a hospitality suite since pre-COVID, and while it hasn't returned officially, it seems our late night socializing tradition has recreated itself informally. This is a friendly reminder that while we love the bonding, self-regulation, on noise levels, especially after 11, is required to prevent rules and restrictions from coming down <laughs> from above. Please keep it quieter tonight, y'all. So, <laughs> you'll probably hear that more today. Um, but with that, I'll get us started. We have three great uh, panels or s talks today. Um, and our first one, we have a lot of great speakers, so I'm going to introduce you to April Long, um, who will kick us off. Our whole panel is kind of looking at our conference theme of learning from the past, investing in the future, kind of through the lens of infrastructure. So April and her group will get us started with a talk on reservoirs, a few different ones. Thanks, I'm thinking that everybody in this room wasn't in the hospitality suite last night since it's an 8.30 presentation. <laughs> Um, well, thanks for joining us. I'm April Long. I'm the executive director of the Rudai Water and Power Authority. Um, as Caitlin mentioned, we're going to talk about reservoirs today. Um, it was after this conference last year that Kendra, Holly, and I um, kind of were all talking about the rivers that we are have a special interest in and how the reservoirs above them are affecting them um, or could affect them. And so that's really how this kind of presentation was born. So we were really happy to see the themes that um, the conference chose this year and to see that ours could fit into that. Um, so, you know, for many of us, reservoirs are essentially a black eye on what could be a wild and free-flowing river. Um, regardless, they were built years ago for good reasons, and they're here to stay. We're not able to get rid of them. Um, and we have really come to rely upon them for kind of obvious reasons like hydropower production and recreation. What we're hoping to talk about is some of the unobvious reasons that we're seeing um, the way that we're, we're able to use re our reservoirs. We're looking at how they affect the, the environment of the rivers downstream of them. Are the, is it good or is it bad? And so we're going to show you a couple of cases, a um, couple of different ways of looking at that. Um, we're you know, we're going to um, talk about three different Western Colorado reservoirs. Oops. So, um, actually, we're talking about four different ones, but three different river systems. I'll be talking about Rudai Reservoir, which is built in the Roaring Fork watershed on the Frying Pan River, um, it you know, and how it affects the, the lower Frying Pan and the lower Roaring Fork. Kendra and Richard are going to be speaking about Dillon Reservoir and how it affects the Blue River. And then Ann B. Rossi and Holly Kirk Kirkpatrick. Holly helped, pre helped prepare the slides in the presentation. Andy's presenting today. are going to be talking about Stagecoach and Yamcola Reservoirs and how they affect the Yampa. Um, so these reservoirs are owned and operated really differently. Um, so we'll hopefully be explaining all of that. Please, speakers, be sure to talk about who owns and operates your reservoir. Um, and then we will, uh, you know, love to hear from the audience afterwards. We'll try to take some questions. So I'm going to hand it over to Andy and let you get started, okay? Over here? Fair enough. Good for you. All right. Everyone hear me okay? Make sure. All right. Okay. Perfect. Uh, my name's Andy Rossi. I'm the general manager for the Upper Yampa Water Conservancy District. I've worked for the district since uh, 2009. And I'm going to talk to you about Stagecoach Reservoir. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Yamcola Reservoir as well because the two reservoirs really are sort of tied together. And as April requested, uh, these two reservoirs are completely owned and operated by my organization, uh, the Upper Yampa Water Conservancy District. So that means um, the facilities are owned by us, the land at Stagecoach, all around it where the state park is, is owned by the Upper Yampa Water Conservancy District. And most importantly, all the water rights are owned outright. We have no shared ownership 
any sort of agreements or sort of different arrangements that you may hear from other uh, presenters today at Stagecoach whatsoever. Um, at Yam Call, it's the same except that we rent the land from the United States Forest Service. So that's the only difference there. So the ownership is fairly clean, about as clean as you could get for reservoirs in Colorado right now. So uh, just to orient everybody, the Yampa River, as many of you know, um, northwest part of the state, about an hour and a half north of where we are right now. Yampa runs for about 250 miles, starts in the flat tops right up here, the headwaters, just above Yampa, Colorado. Runs all the way down to the confluence with the Green River, Echo Park. Beautiful river, as they all are. Uh, Dinosaur National Monument down at the bottom end of the river there. So, Yampa River is famous for a lot of beautiful things, a lot of different things. What it's not famous for is a whole lot of storage. So, these are the major reservoirs in the Yampa system. They add up to about 100,000 acre feet total. So, not very much when we're talking about storage in Colorado or in the western U.S. at all. Um, and what that means is often, you know, we used to say the Yampa was a natural flowing river. Obviously not so much. We've got some reservoirs. But in general, the Yampa River operates with a natural hydrograph most of the time. And the most of the time is what we're going to talk about today. So, as I talk about the two reservoirs, you've got Yamcolo on the right there. That's the headwaters to the Yampa River up in the flat tops and Stagecoach over here. Uh, we're going to focus on Stagecoach. We're going to start with Yamcolo a little bit. Built in 80, raised in 97. Stagecoach was built in 89 and raised in 2010. So uh, 9,600 acre feet in Yamcolo. We can write contracts for about 8,000 acre feet there. Stagecoach, we can write contracts for about 18,000 acre feet. Now, we have to talk about the two of them, and I've tried to do this many times before. And as I go through the interconnected nature of these two reservoirs, I end up like this. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so in an attempt not to do that, I'm going to go a little quicker. And really, I do look like that at the end. I'm like banging on the screen saying, you guys don't understand. Um, the best way to do it is to talk about a timeline. This is about a 15-minute talk, so we're not going to do that. We're going to cut it right to the chase. So if you think about the two reservoirs together, the Amco was built in 80, way upstream headwaters, Stagecoach built in 89. As you can see, between the two reservoirs, there's been a number of different uh, exchange agreements, different storage contracts going out. For Yamcolo, it's about 40-year history. So that's about two generations of water users maybe two engineers' careers, and about eight head rangers for the Forest Service that has gone through this. There's been a lot of change. And you can see for Yamcolo, it's been fully contracted all the way through. And it's a heavily used reservoir, almost entirely agricultural use. Uh, the Yampa River above Stagecoach is the most, I'll say, densely irrigated part of the river. We drain that reservoir almost every year entirely for the ag users to use it. So what that means is it has a huge effect on the inflows into Stagecoach. Stagecoach was first built, again, fully contracted, but if you see these blue dots all the way along, it's been all over the map for the amount of storage. And if you go from 15,000 acre feet back in 89, fully contracted to today, in 2019, we only had 2,500 acre feet of sold contracts. Today we have 5,500 acre feet. We're going to talk about that in a second in a very non-traditional manner. But we've got about 10,000 plus acre feet of water to sell at a stagecoach for the river below stagecoach all the way on the Yampa River. So these things, as we kind of think about these management tools we call reservoirs, they do. They look like these big permanent monoliths. They're all over the map behind the scenes, different arrangements, different delivery schedules. And the other thing you have to remember about the Yampa River is until 2018, the only part of the river that went under administration was above Stagecoach Reservoir. That part of the river went under administration every single year. Below Stagecoach, didn't happen until 2019. It's only happened three times since then for short periods of time. So if we get down to Stagecoach, as a reservoir manager, you're talking about these big monolithic storage projects. As a manager, you always want to ask, okay, why do we build them? We built them supposedly to help out water users. Are the reservoirs keeping pace with the changing basin needs? And for Stagecoach, I would argue yes. Part of that big sort of topsy-turvy contract 
uh, total at Stagecoach was because uh, two things happened. So between 97 and say 2011 or so, things were pretty steady. Contracts were stable. Who can tell me hydraulically what happened in that period that was really important? Anybody? Big thing happened. The big drought in the early 2000s, right? What else happened in 2019 just after that period? Anybody? Big thing for the Yampa Valley. Big snows. Something else not quite water related. Colorado decides that it wants to move the power generation industry away from coal. The two biggest uh, contracts out of Stagecoach Reservoir in the history were for Tri-State Energy at the Craig Stations. Craig Station is due to go offline starting in 2025, should be out of there by 2030 if everything holds. Excel Energy will close its power plant in Hayden in that same period. So the biggest water users besides agriculture in the Yampa Valley are going away. And that's the reason for all of that um, sort of topsy-turvy contracting. The reason why I mentioned the drought, what did the state of Colorado do in response to the drought? Anybody remember? Came online, took a while, about 2012, 2011. What's that? Environmental flows, thank you. That's a Yampa Valley resident, so <laughs> that's why. <laughs> He's a plant. <laughs> um, yeah, so in response to the early 2000 um, uh, drought, the state of Colorado passed what is commonly known as the 3 in 10 law, where you're able to contract with a CWCB and a third party to release water to an in-stream flow. It happens to be an in-stream flow directly below Stagecoach Reservoir. We contracted with the help of the Colorado Water Trust. I don't know if there's anybody here. Uh, and we burned through the 3 in 10 between 2012 and say, 20, say 16, and we were out of sort of bullets, as they say on that one. So you fast forward to now, that's gone. Our power plants have canceled their contracts and along comes a new legislative uh, effort to update the three and 10 to five and 10. So just earlier uh, last year, we renewed our relationship with the Colorado Water Trust and the CWCB and now we have a 30 year contract for the five and 10 and we used one of those mechanisms this year. So we are keeping up for sure. Um, the other thing that comes along is that stagecoach is hydropower. We've got to balance hydropower with downstream water quality. We didn't have any real-time water quality monitoring until 2010. That's because our Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, license didn't require it. So we had to put that in later on. Hydropower is how we're able to uh, really enact those CWCB Colorado Water Trust um, contracts. The other thing going on, tailwaters fishery. Tailwaters fishery about 2006 completely collapsed from whirling disease. Colorado Parks and Wildlife rebuilt the whole thing and now has a self-sustaining population almost of uh, Hofer Harrison trouts there. Downstream pike removal, they've taken out thousands of pike from the downstream reservoir catamount going forward. In reservoir concerns, we're starting now to shift our focus from in, in reservoir fisheries to water quality. We used to be really worried about pike Everyone's heard about the new big concern in reservoirs, algae. We are the exact same thing going on at Stagecoach. We have a basin that's less than 2% developed and we have blue-green algae problems. This right here, this algae water quality concern is gonna end up, I think, being a major concern for our state's reservoirs for the next 10 years. That is gonna be a big driver of what we do with our reservoirs. Changing firming needs. So as I said at Yamcola, we've been fully contracted. I could sell the same amount of water tomorrow to the ag users up there. If we need to do a firming project, if we ever could, the answer has always been yes up there. At Stagecoach, it's kind of been, well, maybe later. You know, we had some drought affect it, and then we had some contracts go away, and right now we're in the sort of maybe later, but our newest contract with the Water Trust has completely replaced one entire power plant's contract. So we might be moving a little closer to yes pretty soon. Pretty interesting concept. You're gonna firm a reservoir to maintain in-stream flows later in the season. It's a tricky one, right? Okay, and last one here, transition from traditional uses contracts 
to new use contracts. So the specificity and the flexibility of our storage rights that we have allow us to do that. The Colorado Water Trust contract basically says, we'll buy just a small amount of water every year. If there's a need for it for in-stream flow in that year, we're happy to bring more money to the table and release it for the benefit of the system. However, if someone else in the basin needs it, we'll back off. So that means if there's an ag producer who's short, there's a municipality who's short, another industrial user, they'll back off as well. So all this together is what we're doing in 2022 with two reservoirs that were built in the 80s. So I think that's about as much time as I have, right, April? Yep. And I'll hand it off to next person. Cool. All right. So my name is Kendra. I'm with the Blue River Watershed Group, and I have up here with me Richard, who is from Trout Unlimited. We're working together on the Blue River IWMP, and we want to contrast what we just heard with the Dillon Reservoir. So the Dillon Reservoir is located about 40 miles east of here in Summit County, Colorado, on the I-70 corridor. <coughs> it was built and became... Uh, operational in 1963. So this is a mile long earthen dam. So significantly larger with a capacity of 257,000 acre feet. And Denver Water, Denver Water is the owner operator of this reservoir and they own 100,000 acre feet of that. That's about a third of what the Blue River Basin generates annually naturally or historically has generated naturally. Um, so this is a, the purpose of this is to divert water to the Front Range through Roberts Tunnel. And they harvest roughly 57,000 acre feet a year, even though they have the rights to 100,000, they usually use only roughly 60% of that. And it is a uh, bottom release dam with the outlet structure about 230 feet below the surface level. And um, there are three ways for this reservoir to release water. So there's the Roberts Tunnel, which goes to the Front Range to the South Platte River. There's the bottom release section of our dam, and that's our outlet that has a minimum flow requirement of 50 CFS. They gave us a range of 150 to 50, so we know they chose 50. <laughs> um, and then the third way to release water out of the Dillon Reservoir is through the Morning Glory Spillway, which is a surface. So if the reservoir reaches elevation, uh, max capacity, then it can overflow through the surface. So the reason this was built is that Denver Water needed storage facility, right, to provide water to the growing front range. And that was something that this reservoir solved. It solved that problem. Great, done. We have the biggest reservoir of Denver Waters facilities in the, the Dillon Reservoir is the largest storage facility for Denver Water. And it's at a notably high elevation. So if we consider 9,200 feet, we have um, less evaporative losses than something you might see in other areas. So that's great. Um, and it also created this amazing recreation of the Dillon Reservoir for Summit County but it also created some problems. So some things that we have to work with in the Dillon is that um, it's just like in general, a phosphorus sink. So we have um, downstream, we have some effects from that. We also have a highly disrupted hydrograph. And you can see in these pictures, this is taken in the last summer um, what we've got is what naturally our stream width and depth were. Um, we no longer have any kind of flushing flows and we don't have um, the habitat created anymore with our new hydrograph. So um, this bottom release dam also creates a really interesting challenge for the Blue River because at 230 feet below surface level, our water is really cold in the summer and it's really warm in the winter. So if we consider the effects of these three items, we've got life cycle changes and we've got habitat changes um, that are significantly impactful. It's the green button. All right, 
Um, thanks, Kendra. Um, my name is Richard Van Geitenbeek, as, as I think we know. Um, I'm a staffer uh, for International TU. I'm based out of Grand Junction. And Kendra and I are speaking about the Dillon Reservoir from the perspective of the Blue River IWMP, or Integrated Water Management Plan, that we've been working on since 2019. And so, you know, Denver Water is the owner of this reservoir, um, but really the, um, the, the catalyst for change that got us started happened in 2016 when the Colorado Parks and Wildlife delists this stretch between Dillon and Green Mountain, and they take it off of gold medal um, status. And so the state and the state commissioners are freaking out, and um, they're going, why did, how did this happen? So in 2016, a group was formed called the Blue River uh, en Enhancement Work Group, which is, the acronym is BREW, which we always enjoy. But um, that group has a lot of good ideas. It involves all of the different stakeholders, everybody from the owners to CPW to local um, interests and that sort of thing. And those people sit around and they toss around a lot of ideas, but over the next four years, they don't really go anywhere because they really don't have any money to do anything. So the, um, so we, we uh, um, got them to uh, accept a, um, a grant. We went to CPW, or uh, Colorado uh, Water Conservation Board and got a grant. And in 2019, we um, uh, started the process of the IWMP. Um, so, what we're doing now is, I, I'll speed this up, because um, I, 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 I go down rabbit holes, but uh, this is the third year or third phase of our IWMP, and it's really focused on the fishery. And so what we're going to do is we've always approached this from the basis of being a community type of plan, that we consider Denver water to be part of this community. They're a water user. They have to be at the table in order to get anything done. So we've always approached it in, in that respect. So in May of 2023, we will issue the final report. And that final report will categorize the variables that we think are, are, are contributing to the decline of the fishery. And it will rate them. It will rate them as like cold water being the worst or the disconnect between channel morphology and flow as being the, the next one. But what it will also do is it will also offer mitigation strategies and costs. And so with that, we're hoping that we can feed that back to the community and the community can then um, move on and, and try to get into the challenges ahead, which are the collaboration process and trying to find funding for this kind of thing. So um, basically, this is a fishery that could be a lot better and, and with some mitigation steps um, uh, incorporated into it, we believe that the fishery could be in a lot better shape. Um, and we think it's really important to deal with, with everybody that's involved. And I know that Kendra threw this last one in, but if you look at how, many or how much water right Denver Water has to the upper blue or to the whole blue system, the system produces about 300,000 acre feet a year. That's their total yield. Denver Water has rights to a third of that. Um, so, and they have traditionally only taken a little bit above half. So, but in, in, a, in a changing climate and that sort of thing, it's very important to have the whole community sitting at the table to get this done. So those are the challenges. Thanks. Okay, thanks. So you um, heard about two reservoirs so far. One, you heard from the owner operator of that reservoir and what he's capable of doing um, and kind of the authority that he has over that. And then you just heard from Kendra and Richard, who do not own and operate Dillon Reservoir, um, but you know are working for the impacts downstream of that. I'm going to talk about Rudi Reservoir, um, which is owned and operated by the Bureau of Reclamation, um, and it is in a complicated part of <laughs> of land. Uh, it splits between Eagle and Pitkin County. The land around it is owned by the Forest Service. Um, the reservoir campgrounds are managed by the Forest Service. There's a program managed by CPW um, to prevent invasive um, mussels. Uh, the Rudi Water and Power Authority, which I sit on, <laughs> funds some of these programs, but we have uh, essentially no water in the reservoir. We have very small amount. We have no authority over what happens in the reservoir at all. We just use their name in, my, in our title. <laughs> 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 um, 
So Root Eye Reservoir is in the Roaring Fork watershed. Um, the picture of it here above um, shows the reservoir, the dam below it, and uh, the lower frying pan river. It was built as part of the Fry Arc project um, as compensatory storage for the West Slope. So essentially, um, there was a large you know, system of diversions. I believe there's 16 diversion structures in the upper frying pan to divert water essentially into the Boosted Tunnel and into the Front Range. Um, and simultaneously was an intended to build a root eye reservoir um, to fill root eye at the same time that those waters are being diverted um, uh, with the intention of meeting the senior water rights needs of the West Slope, which were going to be impacted by this Fry Arc project. Uh, on average, the diversions can carry 56,000 acre feet. I believe they have rights up to 75,000 acre feet. Root Eye Reservoir is a 102,000 acre foot reservoir. Um, it has filled every year since it was built, except for in 2002, and then the last three years. Um, so it is definitely seeing the effects of the drought. Um, let's see. The Bureau manages this reservoir with the intention to fill it without spilling it. This creates lots of confusion for the downstream fisheries, um, the downstream outfitters. They don't understand why they wouldn't release water during the highest um, snowmelt part of the season, during the, what would typically be a peak hydrograph, and they instead release water later in the season. So I'll show you kind of the way that it's altered the hydrograph. Um, the minimum stream flow below the reservoir in the summer is 110 CFS, so that's an obligation that has to be met by the Bureau. Um, and in the winter, it's 39 CFS. So we've talked a little bit, you heard Amy talk about contract water, the same exists in the um, in Rudai Reservoir. Um, so we essentially have a basin below that's 50,000 acre feet that is you know, considered like a recreational pool, even though when the reservoir gets below about 80,000 acre feet, it can't be accessed by um, boats and in, in the marinas and the motor vehicles and or the uh, motorized bo bo boats. Um, the water above it is is split between what's called contract water and fish water. So while this was compensatory storage and there's lots of contract water for that, it also um, serves as a very large portion of the water that is used to help the 15 mile reach. So the endangered fish in the 15 mile reach. I hope you all have heard of it. Can't go into it right now. <laughs> um, and while it wasn't built with a hydropower facility below it, it was intended to have hydropower below it. And that was built in the 80s. The hydropower facility was built in the 80s. And um, that's owned and operated by the city of Aspen. And it provides 20% of the city's 100% renewable energy portfolio. So we had some problems that it solved, and then it had inc incredible opportunities that it created. So unlike below Dillon Reservoir, the fishery in the lower frying pan is outstanding. It was the first gold medal trout stream designated in Colorado. It retains its gold medal um, status. If you Google fishing on the <laughs> frying pan river, you get pictures like this of giant, fat, beautiful fish, lots of happy anglers. It's a $4 million a annual industry for the town of Basalt. Um, it also has incredible still water recreation on the reservoir itself. And uh, like I said, it produces hydropower. Um, problems that are we created with this, okay, so looking at that hydrograph again, these are, um, I just wanna note, these are hydrographs of the releases from Rudai Reservoir in drought years. Um, and so it's showing that struggle to meet that minimum stream flow of 110 CFS, and then just the completely unnatural jumping that happens. So this is because of those, those um, contract and fish water releases that happen later in the year when irrigators and lower Colorado River needs water in it. And so it kind of does this incredible jump around. This is not great for the aquatic life in the Frying Pan River in the Lower Roaring Fork. It's not great for um, planned fly fishing trips um, to see a water spike of 100 CFS. Um, you know, that changes things a lot. It's not great for hydropower production. And so while this wasn't the intended use of Root Eye Reservoir for any of these things, this is what our communities have come to rely upon. Um, and so we have been working closely with the Bureau of Reclamation and all of these other contract water rights holders um, and programs that use water out of, out of root eye to target flows. So um, Seth Mason is in the room. He did a study on the frying pan of 
you know, if you were going to try to get flows, <laughs> what would you want them to do? Like, what are you trying to do with the frying pan? And so this is like this web of variables of, you know, what is your objective? Okay. Um, and so that led to kind of like these targeted flows. And if you look at the very middle column here, you can see that the minimum stream flow is 110 CFS. That's really not getting it. That's the minimum of what's needed. But interestingly, in a lot of the months, around 150 to 200 CFS will do it. That's for aquatic life reasons. Um, also, interestingly, for hydropower needs, our hydropower facility operates best around 200 CFS. Um, our weightable fishing flows are best around 200 CFS. <laughs> and then um, there are some other targets that we're trying to reach, particularly related around temperature. And so this has given, a, given us a kind of a steady conversation with the Bureau about what we're trying to aim for, um, for, the, for the benefits of these communities and these rivers below. Most recently, we've been working with all of that contract water in Rudai Reservoir. There's lots of really tiny contracts that haven't been used before. Um, so trying to ask for the release of that water to improve temperatures in the lower Roaring Fork. So those minimum stream flows do nothing to, pr to protect the temperatures. We're seeing those temperatures really exceeded. Um, and so this last year, we were able to pull some of those contracts together, work with the Bureau of Reclamation on this idea of how to um, find flexibility in the way that they read those contracts so that we could release water just to improve temperatures in the frying pan in the lower Roaring Fork which reduces the stress on the fishery um, and maintains that aquatic life health. So we just sped through those things. <laughs> um, there, basically, we're just trying to, in, to give you a picture of, of reservoirs in Western Colorado are super complicated. The way that they're managed is complicated. The effects that they have on the environment and the communities around them um, is changing. And there are significant efforts and creative conversations around how can we use those reservoirs to meet more of our needs. Um, it looks like we're out of time for questions. We're moving into the next presentation, but we will um, hopefully our speakers can hang around to the end of all of these presentations and take questions at the end. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks all. So I'm going to, uh, we're gonna switch gears and start talking more about fish passages, um, looking at historic passage and changes going into the future. So I'd like to introduce Scott Schreiber, Drake Ludwig, and Richard again. So I won't introduce myself again because I think everyone knows who I am at this point. <laughs> this is a um, this is a project uh, that w was a fish passage project. Um, it retrofitted a culvert un underneath I-70, which conveys Canyon Creek um, about halfway between Glenwood and Newcastle at a little town called Chakra. Um, these are the people that we just introduced. And I'll go quickly into um, objectives. What we're trying to do, and, and, and I'll, I'll give you a little backstory too, is that there are three creeks in this area between Glenwood and Newcastle. There's Mitchell Canyon Creek, which is what this project is on, and the next one is Elk Creek. But what we've been doing over time is we've been trying to um, take out um, or, or modify irrigation diversions primarily and to make them fish passable. And to, um, it, it, in doing that, it's a multiple benefit project. It helps the ag producer and it helps the environment as well. So uh, what we've been trying to do is, and, and, and this is for Canyon Creek as well, is to open the space into spawning trout from the Colorado River, River main stem and to provide fish passage during high spring flows and low flows in the, in, in the fall. We think it provides multiple benefits, as we said, to the ag community, to recreation, and that sort of thing. It's also, as these guys have done with these awesome modeling processes, is to help the um, knowledge base of fish passage. Most of fish passage stuff has been done in the Northwest, and it's highly variable, because every single situation that you run into is going to be different. Um, no, no two ways are the same. So, and we also were helping out CDOT on this one. CDOT's the owner of the, of the uh, culvert. Um, there was some old 
uh, fish passage stuff that was in there that had caused some pretty bad scour. The project location, as I said, you can see um, you got Glenwood Springs down here. That's the uh, chakra, and it reaches up into um, the south side of the flat tops. So that's why these streams, I think, are really important for spawning is they're perennial, they're freestone, they come off the flat tops. The flat tops don't seem to be affected so much by the vagaries of El Nino and La Nina. They seem to be fairly consistent. Um, so uh, they're really important creeks to get opened up because they, they provide this resiliency for the main stem fish to go out to have refuge, to do their spawning, and then also for juvenile rearing of the fish within that, within that system. The hydrographs drop out real fast um, towards, the end of the, towards the end of the season. Um, here is the box culvert itself. Um, it's a double barrel. It was built during the I-70 construction. It's long and it's steep, which means that during the spring, um, you get a super high flow or fat high velocity flows, which the rainbows have trouble negotiating. In the, in the uh, fall, it's the opposite problem. There's not enough water. Fish will have to basically crawl through this culvert to get upstream and to spawn. So what we've done is to modify that. We put all the modifications into the, um, into this is the lower end, so, so into the right side. And then we block up the, uh, block up the other side for low flows. Um, we think this, and this is, for this is why we're doing this and wh why we think it's so important. We believe that these fish in the main stem of the Colorado act like anadromous fish where they are um, essentially like salmon or steelhead. They will come back to their home streams to spawn. And so we're really trying to in encourage that because we believe that that gives a, a certain amount of resiliency to that whole system um, to withstand climate change, fires, um, and things like that. So it, it gives it another outlet, another, another um, uh, capacity to, to withstand um, you know, catastrophic change. Um, this is a picture of the fish in the spring, um, and you can see the rainbows sort of building up here. That, in, in probably 10 days from that, that time, if the water were still clear, that entire, you wouldn't even be able to see that bottom. It would be entirely black with fish. Um, and these are big fish. These are fish that you know, are anywhere from 18 to 25 um, inches. When we did the one down on Elk Creek, we electroshocked one hole that we got 500 fish out of. Um, and the biggest one was a, was a female brown, and she was almost 10 pounds, and she was huge. So um, it, it's a really important resource to try and develop and, and, and protect. So I'm going to turn it over to Scott, and he's going to give you a little background on history. Thanks a lot, Richard. Uh, yes, Scott Schreiber, water resource engineer with Wright Water Engineers. Um, first of all, kudos to Trout Unlimited and all the work they did. Typical project. Took two years before we even really started all the funding, and so Richard was huge to get that going. Um, so obviously our conference is dealing with like past, present, future kind of thing, so we thought we'd do a little head nod to that. So it was really neat. When we first got out there, you know, this culvert was built approximately in the 70s, but they had wooden baffles. So they actually had about a series of 13 different baffles, and you can see these in these pictures here, and we'll zoom in, um, that went up and down one cell of the culvert. So this is the river left culvert looking downstream here. Uh, the only concern we had with these baffles is that they were aligned heavily, you know, just so they had one fish passage channel along the inside wall. What that ended up doing was super concentrating flows, heavy scour. There were actually areas where it eroded down to the rebar. So really, really cool that they were trying to do this back in the 70s and definitely some head nods to them. But we wanted to take what they did and see what we could do to maybe make it a little better, help CDOT with some of the maintenance aspects out there also too. So. It was really cool to see it. Basically, they were wood timbers that they had, you know, driven down with, with uh, bolts and nails into the left cell of the culvert. There were approximately, I think, three or four left when we started the project. The majority of them had been washed out downstream. Um, and we've got a couple videos that show this, but as Richard was pointing, you know, the main criteria here is sort of looking at fall, and you can sort of see over here uh, barely, but, you know, it was like three inches of water in these culverts, and they're running super critical, super fast. It was a, you know, pretty tough... Uh, Tough culvert for these fish to navigate. This is again showing it more in the spring runoff. <coughs> Even with higher flows, you're getting multiple hydraulic jumps. You know, really tough for these fish to move upstream at. I'm gonna pass this to Drake real quick. Drake's my right hand man. He's sort of the brains behind the operation, does all the modeling. <laughs> there's there's a lot of work that goes into coordinating these projects too. So, I, I I'm just modeling these. Um, 
So a lot of work has been done since the 1970s when those baffles were originally installed uh, to better understand um, you know, the conditions within culverts that are conducive to fish passage. Um, and so there are a lot of different documents out there now, kind of guidance documents on you know, how to design a culvert to promote fish passage. Um, and a lot of the guidance that has been developed is really geared towards the installation of new culverts. You know, there, there's some documentation on retrofitting uh, existing culverts. You know, this particular culvert is pretty challenging. As Richard alluded to, it's a very steep culvert um, and it's a double cell. Um, and so we have a whole lot of constraints to deal with. You know, we also, in retrofitting this, we don't want to reduce the capacity or the primary function of the culvert under I-70. So we're dealing with multiple constraints here. Um, during our literature review, we, we came across this study that was recently done and published in 2019 out of Lisbon, Portugal, actually. Um, and they had l specifically looked at different alternatives and baffle configurations for retrofitting what they call ramped weirs, um, essentially, you know, box culverts. And so they looked at a number of different alternatives from, you know, a uh, natural kind of stream substrate alternative modeled up there as A on the on the top there, and then a number of different baffle configurations, um, and, and they, they built physical models of these alternatives or these different configurations. They also built um, digital models and modeled each of these in uh, a 3D hydraulic software. So they actually, with their physical models, did a bunch of studies about which uh, configuration is most successful for fish passage. Um, and so one of the most important conclusions that we identified from this study, and we were actually able to uh, reach out to Susanna, who was one of the primary authors of this, was that um, the more suitable conditions for fish passage um, to successfully negotiate a ramped weir um, would be retrofitting those with natural cobble substrate. And the reason for that is because it creates a homogeneous area with reduced velocity and turbulence. So the fish can find areas of refugia um, with that more natural kind of culvert bottom. So we, we, you know, took the existing conditions, kind of, you know, recommendations that have been developed to date, kind of, you know, different recommendations from the various uh, uh, guidance documents out there and we came up with a number of different alternatives um, in partnership with CPW, CDOT, Richard with T TU, and um, you know, ultimately modeled these using a 2D hydraulic model. Um, so you can see here, we've got a number of different baffle configurations, you know, more of your historically, you know, um, typically used retrofit design. And then we also, added some more natural stream substrate structure, some boulders into those alternatives um, that we used to model them. So quickly going over hydrology, Scott always likes to say horseshoes, hand grenades, and hydrology, just because there's so many unknowns with the hydrology out here. Um, we use stream stats to look at um, what our typical design flows might um, be for the um, fall months when we have a lot of concerns with their upstream movement. So we were looking around 20 CFS for the optimal function of this. So getting into kind of the 2D modeling exercise here, um, each of these kind of alternatives have a similar slide layout on the far left here. Um, that shows this detailed DEM that was created for each alternative using um, AutoCAD. Essentially we built a digital model of each alternative We've got a results layer of the depth and the velocity of each alternative. This slide um, shows kind of the unimproved culvert condition. So if there weren't any fish passage um, structures within that culvert, we would be seeing a maximum depth of 0.3 feet and a maximum velocity of seven and a half feet per second. So the, the you know, desire to promote fish passage through the culvert is really to um, increase that minimum depth and decrease the velocity through the culvert. 
So we modeled kind of the existing conditions, the historic kind of um, horizontal baffle structure there. And you can see in the model result here on that bottom right, you know, we got pretty good agreement with what we had observed in the field. Um, you know, you can see these high velocity areas uh, that really developed that scour in the bottom of the culvert and prevented fish from navigating upstream, you know, not only because you've got a velocity barrier at that opening of the baffle, um, but you have areas of really shallow depth as well. So we looked at a uh, alternative with diagonal baffles as well. Um, these baffles were um, configured such that they had a slope to them similar to the design of a barb and kind of a stream um, restoration project where the center of the baffle, you know, along the center of the culvert is at a lower elevation than that on the wall to concentrate flows to the inside. Here you still see high velocities, you know, between each baffle structure. Another alternative that was considered were the baffle structures, the diagonal baffle structures with natural substrate, so cobbles. Um, and with the additional roughness from that natural substrate, you really see reduced velocities between those baffle structures. We looked at an alternative that didn't have any of the baffle structures. Um, fairly similar results, we did see kind of higher maximum velocities without the baffle structures because there was nothing to really break up the flow. Um, so you could see, you know, large kind of strings of high velocity areas moving through the culvert. And then we worked with CPW to kind of develop one kind of alternative that might better replicate, you know, a typical cross vein as you might design in a stream restoration project and, and looked at how that would um, score here with our velocity and depth. Um, you know, the natural substrate went through the middle of the culvert, but the spacing um, and the lack of the substrate on the, on the outside really created high velocities that weren't conducive to fish passage. This is kind of an overview of all the different modeling runs that we did. Um, ultimately, we selected the alternative with the diagonal baffles and um, boulder structures. Um, to, to retrofit this culvert. Each of the baffles were about eight feet long and the boulders were actually um, concrete hemispheres that we used and they ranged in size between 12 and 18 inches. Um, this alternative, like it was shown on the last slide, increased the depth in that low flow condition to above a foot and velocities below 3.5 feet per second. Um, it also increased kind of sinuosity and, and the flow through the channel We've got a few videos at the end to show, you know, how flow moves from baffle to baffle across the culvert. Um, and I will turn it back over to Scott to talk about construction. Thanks, Jake. Uh, yeah, and you know, one other thing that was really, really neat about this project, you know, we probably could throw just baffles in there, just boulders in there, but what was really nice, you know, these baffles actually end up causing backwater two or three baffles upstream. So these fish can navigate this process, sort of duck away off into the corner of these areas, and you'll see it in the videos where they can sort of hang out, relax, recharge. I mean, 300 feet, I mean, yeah, these are mountain Olympian trout, but they actually need to take a break every once in a while. Um, we actually were up there touring it with some CSU students uh, maybe a month or so ago. A couple of them said they saw fish up in the, in the culvert, so it'll be pretty neat. Um, this is the scour hole. This is the downstream side. Uh, Honestly, it's the first project I'm proud of removing probably one of the best fishing holes in the area. You would literally go down there and see 200, 300. Kendall back, it said 500 fish at a time. It would be such a black mass of fish that couldn't move upstream um, that you actually couldn't see the bottom and you couldn't recognize the fish. Uh, we went over there one day with a long survey rod and made the fish jump and CDOT was on board in half a second. It was actually really cool to see CDOT get involved with this project. So really neat. So again, we threw a little bit of the kitchen sink at it. Um, one other element we did, we did do a little upstream work, you know, trying to, you know, force some of those lower flows, those 17 CFS into that river left cell. Um, but was also neat, you know, we'll get to construction here in a second, is you can actually see this thing start to fill up. So you can almost see the river build itself once we start to let water go through here. All right, so construction. So this is one of the real neat parts about this. Um, so as Drake mentioned, um, you know, we used precast concrete 
uh, uh, boulders, right? And these were actually the strongman competition balls. So this is during COVID. It took three or four months to actually get these molds and build them. They had a piece of rebar jabbed in them that we could actually drill into the existing culvert, epoxy them in. The baffles were also all precast. Um, they were able to bring them in via crane. Um, so we really didn't impact any of the stream waterways, have to deal too much with the core. We did talk to Travis and let him know what we were doing out there, and he was 100% on board. Um, but then it was talking about how do we lay this thing out. Um, so literally got in my garage, cut all these different templates, made about four or five different scenarios of them. Me, Drake, we also had GEI, uh, Ashley Ficky involved in the project, who helps out on all our projects here. And we literally just started getting there and just sort of throwing stuff down. You know, we knew where the baffles were going to go, but we wanted to provide some irregularities with regards to the boulders, make sure we had enough room for fish passage for these fish to move. Um, so it was actually sort of fun, and literally the contractor just came right behind us and zzz, zzz, drilled holes, brought the boulders in, laid them in, glued them in, and epoxied. So, you know, they, they got the project built in a handful of weeks. Um, they actually, it was Kistner Construction. They were great to work with. They would wrap up a day somewhere else in another project, go to their shop, and form these for us, and then... They were great. They gave us a killer discount on a lot of the work, so kudos to Kistner. Um, but construction was really, really fun. Um, again, so now we're getting into the future. Excuse the graffiti. We decided maybe we should paint the culvert next time as part of this. But um, we'll do a little video, but what you're seeing, we're looking upstream here right now, and you'll start to see some of the uh, how the water actually prop. Oh, we're not going to get a new video yet. All right, we're going to take you back. So again, um, a unique thing that came out of this is Flow 3D approached us. And so the study Drake was looking at was also evaluating Flow 3D. So we're working with Brian Fox right now, um, sort of studying our project under a three-dimensional evaluation. We are also working with CPW. They did a fish shocking prior to the project. So we all went up in the field, determined our fish counts upstream of it. And we'll actually be heading back out there again to do a fish study again. And we'll probably do this over the next couple of years. Five minutes. Okay, we're about good. Um, so we are trying to test this project, and heck, if it doesn't work, we'll be here presenting next year telling you what not to do. Um, so uh, hopefully it works. Hopefully we're seeing fish move upstream. We want to put some GoPros in there and do a lot of cool stuff. Um, it goes without saying, if you guys want to tour this or come check it out, let us know. We'll walk you down there. Um, we've had some newspaper articles and CSU out there looking at it. Again, some more 3D uh, distribution velocities and basically showing that we do have flow paths moving upstream. And I think they actually modeled this at about 200 CFS, so even a greater flow rate. Um, this is one of the one of the videos. We'll just sort of scroll through a little bit, but you know, this is the other side. You know, again, two, three inches of water. This is sort of in the late flows, also too. Um, yeah, you can see it sort of cross waving. I mean, basically, originally it was you know three inches of water. Now we're showing a foot of water. Um, plenty of movement for fish. The boulders break up some of the velocity vectors of the baffles, but they work in combination pretty great together. And you can sort of see the areas of refugia um, that end up placing itself uh, up against the walls, and these fish can have a place to hang out for a few minutes. There is a YouTube video out there too. Feel free to just Google Right Water YouTube, and it talks about how the process and everything we went through gets into the design drawings a lot more. This is looking downstream, going upstream. But you can see the baffles and the boulders again all place, and you can sort of see the length of this culvert. I mean, it's a big culvert, and that's sort of half the issues that we started having here. All right, and that's it. Um, we'll take a few questions if you guys have some time. <laughs> you know, honestly, why we were doing the project, CDOT, CPW already reached out. I think these were floating around up actually up in the Yampa area for a couple culverts up there. But that was part of it. It's like, how can we mimic this and do it somewhere else? We're 3%. You know, we're not just shoving, you know, substrate in there with some sills. Uh, so we had to bolt some things down and how can you do it fast and efficient? Now, the sediment transport, I mean, it's a steep culvert. You know, we do have some bed load. We were actually up there recently. Saw very little accumulation. And I'll be honest. Don't really care if it accumulates. Yeah, we probably don't want five foot boulders sticking in there, but some fine grain material up against the refu I mean, fine with me. I got no issues whatsoever. The culvert has plenty of capacity. We just really didn't want to limit the inlet conditions. So that was the big concern here. I'm not putting anything directly there. Sort of would be cool if we get a bunch of fines and maybe they start spawning in there. <laughs> yes, sir. Sure. 
we're doing barriers everywhere. Yeah, we started with um, CPW really, really early on the next creek down. And so in each case, both this, this one, um, Canyon Creek and Elk Creek, both have natural barriers to protect the CRCs above, above those natural falls. So they were comfortable with us allowing and encouraging fish to come in. In Mitchell Creek, which is in West Glenwood, they have a hatchery on that creek. And there are three diversions between the hatchery and the, and the confluence, but the, all they wanted to do was make sure that we protect the, um, the, the hatchery by, if we consolidate all of those diversions into one, that that is a fish block, it is a fish passage block. So yeah, we've been working with them uh, diligently, um, you know, to, to make sure that we protect any CRCs that are up, up, upstream. Yeah, we're doing a barrier on Roan Creek right now with Middle Colorado Watershed Cancel uh, for that exact reason for implementation up there, but we thought this was a decent one to reconnect. Any other questions? Yes, sir. That was definitely something we discussed a lot and chatted with CPW. They actually just finished up the pooter after we got done here. We sort of heard the horror stories of having to cut rocks, rocks breaking, rocks freezing, rocks cr breaking then. We thought this has more of a low maintenance approach. Um, I haven't been able to, you know, ask a fish if he really cares if it was concrete or a rock. You know, I think it allows for a lot. It's more feasible, I think, when you're getting in a situation to load these in, put the rebar in. Um, the baffles themselves, you know, it'd be tough to do something out of natural material that wouldn't degrade like the wood. But yeah, we, we talked about getting boulders and cutting them in half. It just started to turn into more of a bigger deal. I would also add the cost um, as we started to talk about this in, in design processes and we were looking at, at using natural rock. Um, I, my background is fisheries and landscape architecture and I was in sort of in charge of the, the budget and I said we are not doing natural rock because I know what that's going to cost and I've seen too many projects get blown up on that. And, and even so, uh, in the end, I mean we had a lot of different partners. We had Fish and Wildlife Service Fish Passage. We had CWCB, we had the Round Table, we had Trout and Salmon Foundation, and then in the end, the River District actually had to jump in and save us because we went even over just doing what what you know what, what Scott shown you we, we did with the concrete. Um, so it ended up being about a quarter of a million dollar project, but we got it done. And most of those pictures I think are from des December of last year when we finished it up. Sure. Um, well, I mean, we, we have an integrated water management plan, and this popped out in that. It popped out in our BIP. It's popped out in numerous planning documents, but it, it really doesn't take any more than going down there during a spawn or, you know, right before or after the spawn, and you see the five or six fishermen just down there snagging, and you see the hundreds and hundreds of fish just stacking up. It makes it a pretty low-hanging fruit. And it's, that's, I mean, we want to work our way upstream. So best to start there, let them start to activate the areas. We'll go to the next upstream one, and we've actually already been meeting with those landowners. So. It was a little bit of an easy priority, honestly. Um, you know, CDOT was on board also due to the maintenance aspect, so we started talking to them at day one. Um, they basically, you know, wanted the scour evaluation, so we did have uh, structural engineers from Fonsworth, Crystal Bacchus, involved with the project. So I don't know if we actually developed the matrices. It still would hit top priority, but it was really just a sort of a duh, kind of, we need to do this one first. Our last speaker, we're going to look east of the divide um, on the Platte River system in Colorado, Nebraska, and Wyoming, and hear about the Platte River Recovery Implementation Program. Is this on now? Yep. 
All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Seth Turner. I'm a senior water resources engineer with uh, Headwaters Corporation and the water plan coordinator for the Platte River Recovery Implementation Program. Uh, just a little bit about Headwaters, since uh, we might not be well known. Uh, I know, you know, there's another Headwaters Engineering in Utah, and Water Education Colorado has Headwaters Magazine, and this conference has Headwaters level sponsorships. We are not any of those things. Uh, we, Headwaters, uh, we are also unique in that um, the name is derived because our founders were a psychologist and a water engineer, so it's Headwaters. Um, so, uh, yeah, Headwaters Corporation was founded in 2007 to provide the executive director's office staffing for the Platte River Recovery Implementation Program. So we are responsible for all of the day-to-day -day activity that the program carries on, and we employ everyone from field biologists to, uh, we have an ecological statistician, we have GIS analysts, uh, water engineers, river scientists, geomorphologists, and, and whatnot. So sort of full service for everything that the uh, program might need. But enough about headwaters. So what is the Platte River Recovery Implementation Program? So the program is an endangered species recovery program that encompasses the entire Platte River Basin from the headwaters of the South Platte and North Platte Rivers in Colorado, all the way down to the Central Platte River east of Grand Island, Nebraska. Uh, the program is a cooperative effort of the three states, Colorado, Wyoming, and Nebraska, and the Department of the Interior. And uh, the program finally started uh, in 2007, following more than a decade of negotiations that stretch back to the mid-1990s. Uh, the, again, the program started on J January 1st, uh, 2007. That was to be a 13-year first increment. Uh, by around 2016 or so, it became apparent that not all of the first increment objectives were going to be met. So the program, there was more negotiations, and we are now in year three of a first increment extension that will continue through 2032. Uh, so. Essentially, the, the primary focus area for the program's work is this 90-mile uh, associated habitat reach that extends from Lexington, Nebraska to Chapman, Nebraska. But what the program really does is it provides Ex Endangered Species Act coverage for, all, for water users throughout the entire basin. Uh, in Colorado, those water users in the South Platte Basin participate in the South Platte Water-Related Activities Program and that, pro that program generates the funding that then operates the Tamarack Groundwater Recharge Project in northeastern Colorado. Sure, it doesn't raise her pointer, but in the area, the last 35 miles of the river downstream of Crook, uh, there's uh, recharge projects, uh, so the Tamarack Project and the Colorado Plan for Future Depletions. So the species of interest for the program, there are uh, four species. We're gonna be switching from mostly fish to, to birds now. Uh, of, of particular interest are the whooping cranes, which you see here uh, standing in the river. Whooping cranes are the largest bird in North, Car uh, North, not, not North Carolina, North America. <laughs> North America, they're nowhere near North Carolina. North America, uh, standing about five feet tall with a wingspan of seven to eight feet. So they are uh, large, magnificent birds. Uh, the only remaining migratory population uh, passes through the Great Plains twice a year in the spring and fall. Uh, between uh, wintering grounds in and around the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge on the Texas coast and their summer breeding grounds in the Wood Buffalo National Park in northeastern Al Alberta and the southern Northwest Territories. Um, the uh, migratory population uh, numbered about 16 birds in the 1940s and as of the most recent count last winter uh, is now up to about 543 individual birds and that represents about 65% of the entire species population, uh, with the rest being uh, in captivity, as well as a couple of small reintroduced populations in Louisiana and Florida. Other species of interest to the program, a couple small shorebirds that spend the spring and summer nesting and fledging in the Central Platte area, the interior least tern, which was actually federally delisted in uh, February of 2021. Uh, and but remains protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and the Nebraska Non-Game and Endangered Species Conservation Act. Uh, also the piping plover, which is another small shorebird you see there in the middle. And the fourth species of interest to the program uh, is the pallid sturgeon. Pallid sturgeons are present in the Missouri River and the lowest reaches of the Platte down near Omaha 
have similar habitat to the, uh, to the Missouri. So it's expected that there are probably pallids in the lower reaches of the river, but we don't do a lot of active work. Uh, most of our work is focused on the bird species uh, in the central plat, and it's more of a do no harm approach to the, uh, to the pallids in the lower plat. So to, to figure out you know, what happened, uh, why we eventually needed an endangered species recovery program on the Platte River, we needed to take a step back to the late 19th century and take a look at water resources development in the basin. So this is just an, a representative example based on some work that we did several years ago. Uh, notably, it does not include the South Platte Basin of Colorado, so these are not complete figures for the entire basin. But just to give you an idea that, you know, once settlers started uh, migrating west and soon realized that rain really did not follow the plow, uh, it was necessary to irrigate in order to grow crops and survive. So uh, the last 30 years of the, uh, from about 1875 to 1905, there was a big rush of small canal development uh, in the North Platte and Platte Basins and, and in Colorado as well. Uh, most of those were small canals with a couple of notable exceptions being the, uh, the the Wheatland Irrigation System in Wyoming and the very large Tri-State uh, Irrigation Canal that diverts uh, far up on the North Platte River near the Wyoming-Nebraska border. Uh, so following that period around the turn of the, the century, the Reclamation Service came into being and started building larger projects. Uh, those included the Interstate Canal and the Fort Laramie Canal that divert from the uh, Wayland Diversion Dam in Wyoming. And then a few decades later, in the 1930s and 40s, you had a couple of very large power and irrigation systems that were developed in central Nebraska by the Nebraska Public Power District and the Central Nebraska Public Power and Irrigation District. Uh, so, and again, you know, smaller canals early on, uh, larger canals, larger, fewer canals uh, later. Uh, but in total, just with those that we've, we've looked at, you know, you had nearly 27,000 acre feet of cumulative CFS of canal diversion in those areas. Also, once they began irrigating, it was apparent that the uh, spring runoff was not sufficient to sustain and keep those canals full through the entire growing season. So reservoir construction began. And between 1897 and 1980, there was about 5.7 million acre feet of cumulative storage constructed in the North Platte River Basin. 85% uh, of that is in just four reservoirs uh, which were constructed, uh, Pathfinder Reservoir, Seminole Reservoir, Lake McConaughey, and Glendo Reservoir. So, and all of those are on-channel reservoirs. So significant changes to the hydrology of the system through all of those diversions, all of this on-channel storage. So the cumulative effect of that was that you had a Platte River system, particularly the central Platte downstream of all of this development that, you know, when the first settlers came out, it was described as being a mile wide and an inch deep. So you went from this very wide, shallow uh, riverbed. It was heavily braided to a river that became, over time, uh, much narrower, much more incised. And uh, instead of you know, wide open uh, corridors that were preferred by the whooping cranes when they're migrating, you ended up with a heavily vegetated, particularly the cottonwoods and, and trees like that, uh, a riparian corridor. So a couple of examples of what this looks like. Um, you know, here we have imagery from 1938. This is the North Platte River at North Platte. Again, you can see that it's a wide, shallow, heavily braided channel. And then 80 years later, uh, we have a channel that is very heavily vegetated, particularly on the north side where you used to see a lot of that flow. And now we just have a couple of narrow threads of flow uh, coming through that reach. Uh, and that, that bridge area is actually now referred to a, as a choke point because the capacity has been so constrained that uh, whereas in the early 20th century, we frequently had flows above 10,000 CFS uh, at North Platte. Now the capacity at that location at flood stage is less than 2,000 CFS. So it's a significant constraint on being able to deliver water through there. Another example, uh, this is further downstream on the Platte River main stem between Lexington and Overton, Nebraska. This is uh, at the Johnson number two hydropower return from the CNPPID system. Uh, we have, a, there's a permanent Jeffrey Island there in the middle. Uh, again, this is 1938 imagery. You can see uh, wide, heavily braided channels on either side of that island. Uh, the canal segment that you see there connecting to the river is what became the uh, J2 hydropower return. And then 80 years later, 
uh, that north channel on the north side of the island, uh, just a couple of narrow threads there, that area rarely sees, it's downstream of all but one of the major irrigation canals and rarely sees a whole lot of flow except in very wet years. And then on the south side of the island, uh, where we have now had clear water returns from the hydropower plant for the last 80 years. You have a channel that went from uh, heavily braided to deeply incised and uh, more meandering plan form. And so you can see that those uh, channels that were active in 1938, those are now on a terrace that is 15 to 20 foot higher than the active channel. So a great deal of incision there. Um, let's see. So what is the program doing about all of this? The program actually has three components. There is a water component, which I'm gonna be speaking of. There is also uh, land and adaptive management aspects. Um, but again, I'm focusing on the water here. So the, the program's first increment water objective is to reduce deficits to Fish and Wildlife Service target flows at Grand Island, Nebraska by an average of 130,000 to 150,000 acre feet per year. So there's a couple pieces to unpack there. Uh, when we talk about the Fish and Wildlife Service target flows, these are target flows that were developed in the early 90s based on uh, spe perceived species and habitat needs, and those are represented by the, the green line there on the chart. Uh, and when we talk about deficits, and I'll also talk about excesses that we can divert for recharge projects and retiming purposes. So the gray shaded areas above the, above the target flow, those are excesses. So, you know, if, if the river is in excess, if all of the other in-stream flows are met, then we can divert that water into a recharge project or other project for retiming purposes. And then the yellow shaded area are those deficits that we are trying to make up. And then in terms of the 130,000 to 150,000 acre foot goal, uh, the program, there were at, the, at the outset, there were three initial state water projects uh, that included the Tamarack Groundwater Recharge Project in Colorado, Pathfinder EA in Wyoming, and the Ta uh, Lake McConaughey Environmental Account in Nebraska, both of those which I'll talk about in a minute. And those were credited with providing 80,000 acre feet per year of that deficit reduction. And then we are in the process of implementing a water action plan that is tasked with implementing the other, developing the other 50,000 acre feet through a series of water supply and conservation projects. And we are currently have 12 different active water action plan projects and are incrementally progressing towards that goal. So getting to the point of the whole presentation, you know, what are we actually doing and how are we using that existing infrastructure to restore river flows for threatened and endangered species? Uh, we're gonna take a look at some of those water action plan projects. Uh, first, we're gonna start at far upstream uh, at Pathfinder Reservoir. Pathfinder is about 50 miles upstream of Cas Casper, Wyoming, uh, 300 miles upstream of Lake McConaughey, and 400 miles upstream of the program's associated habitat reach. The reservoir was constructed uh, by the Reclamation Service, completed in 1909, and as they were negotiating the program, it was determined that through a century of sedimentation, about 54,000 acre feet of the storage capacity had been lost to sedimentation. So they, Wyoming constructed what they called the Pathfinder Modification Project, and it's basically this concrete weir that was built over the spillway to raise the water level about two and a half feet. And in the process of doing that, the, uh, that was made it able to reclaim 54,000 acre feet of storage. That storage capacity is split between two accounts, a, uh, a 34,000 acre foot environmental account uh, and the water that accrues to the environmental account each year, all of that, um, all of that gets uh, delivered to the program each year. And then there's also a 20,000 acre foot. Pathfinder municipal account uh, in which we have a leasing arrangement with the Wyoming Water Development Office for up to 9,600 acre feet per year. So all of that water accrues in those accounts during the spring and summer, and then in late August, early September, that water is released down the North Platte River uh, and stored in the environmental account in Lake McConaughey. So the Lake McConaughey environmental account was actually established as part of FERC licensing for a couple of hydropower projects in central Nebraska. It has a 2,000, 200,000 acre foot capacity. Uh, and we presently have seven water sources that we are putting into that account. Uh, again, there are the two Pathfinder sources. 
Uh, there's also, as part of Nebraska's contribution to the program, we have um, the, the, the account gets 10% of the storable natural inflows as measured at the Llewellyn gauge at the upstream of the reservoir uh, between October and April each year. And then there are uh, four other water action plan projects, mostly surface water leases that contribute to that project. So having this, this bucket, or uh, this, you know, bucket of water in Lake McConaughey allows us to make releases for targeted purposes down through the habitat reach. And an example of that, uh, you know, historically, I guess let me back up a minute. The, the environmental account is, it is officially overseen by the Fish and Wildlife Service. They designate an environmental account manager and then we, uh, program staff and the, the power and irrigation districts, coordinate with them to, to plan out and operate these, uh, these releases. And in the past, releases have been made during the whooping crane migrations in the spring or fall to put water in the river during those times uh, for other purposes. But for the last three years, we have been testing a hypothesis uh, to determine whether program water can actually be used to uh, maintain those wide open vegetation-free channels that the whooping cranes prefer. Uh, so we are calling these germination suppression releases. We are targeting 1,500 CFS of, uh, at, at Grand Island uh, between June 1st and July 15th. Uh, so what you can see, this is 2020, 21, and 22, the, re the releases in succession. The blue line represents the actual environmental account release. The gray is the natural flow at the Grand Island gauge. Uh, and then the yellow is the environmental account water on top of that. And it's, it's sort of been a, you know, as it has dried out over the last three years, you can see the native flow has declined. The amount of EA water that is necessary to make these releases has increased. Um, and it is, uh, you know, one of the things about this is that it is really, really difficult to hit a specific flow target when you are dealing with a location that is 200 miles downstream and eight days travel time from your release point. And in between you have, you know, this is, this is June that we're making these releases and you have a dozen irrigation canals that start ramping up and you have hydropower generation going on. It's the peak of thunderstorm activity. So there's all sorts of things. So hitting that target is really damn difficult, uh, but we are, we're, we're doing our best uh, and, and we're, gonna, we're planning to do this again next year, and then we're going to do some analysis to sort of determine, is this really helping uh, in terms of suppressing the germination of cottonwoods and other vegetation? So some of the other projects, uh, getting into some of the canals, we, there are five irrigation canals in the reach between Brady and Cozad, Nebraska. Most of those were built in the 1890s, so they've been there for a long time. We can utilize these canals for uh, groundwater recharge purposes during the non-irrigation season. Uh, you know, unfortunately, these are not particularly photogenic projects, unlike the, uh, you know, West Slope rivers and whatnot. So you get a, you get one of the headgate diversion structures for one of those plains canals there. But uh, we uh, have been operating these projects for several years now, and and again, it's during the non-irrigation season. Uh, water can be uh, diverted into those canals when, you know, when we have excess flows, when it's not so cold that there are icing conditions and whatnot, and then it just, it, it goes into the canal and then it seeps in for groundwater recharge. And then lastly, we have the Central Nebraska Public Power and Irrigation District irrigation system. It is a very large irrigation system that stretches across three, three counties. Uh, in Central Nebraska, south of the Platte River, we have two, uh, active recharge projects that are utilizing that existing infrastructure. The first being the Phelps County Canal Recharge Project. Uh, the canal is checked at milepost 13.3 of that, so they can run water in during the non-irrigation season, fill up the first 13 miles of that canal, and then allow that to, to soak in. Uh, diversions for that have been pretty limited over the last couple of years, again, as things have dried, dried out. But in the past, we have had extended periods of recharge where they have run water continuously from say mid-November to mid-February uh, and you know get a lot of water in that way. The other one is Elwood Reservoir. Elwood Reservoir was constructed in the 1970s to provide supplemental irrigation supply to this E65 system down here. Uh, it is built on a ridge and it is a leaky bucket so it proved ideal for uh, recharge purposes. 
And we actually can, because it's off the canal, we can run water into that year round when it's available. And we can, uh, we have a contract for up to 15,000 acre feet of diversions into that reservoir each year. So to take a look at just sort of what are the impacts, how much water are we talking about that the program has dealt with with this existing infrastructure. Uh, again, we have seven sources contributing to the Lake McConaughey environmental account. Uh, these numbers are through 2020. And at that point, we had uh, added almost a million acre feet had been put into that environmental account. And more than 700,000 had been released for different purposes, uh, such as the germination suppression test that I talked about. Um, you know, because that is part of a larger reservoir, it is assessed a proportional uh, amount of evaporation and seepage losses. So we do have a discrepancy there between how much water has been put into the account and how much is, has been released back to the river to benefit the species. And then the groundwater recharge projects, again, through 2020, uh, some of those had been operating almost a decade at that point, And we had diverted at that point almost 150,000 acre feet into groundwater recharge. And I don't have the numbers really on how much of that has come back to the river because, because of the short duration of the project operation compared to the time it takes for groundwater migration, uh, particularly for Elwood Reservoir, which is anywhere from 10 to 16 miles from the river, uh, depending on the direction of flow. Um, so, you know, the, the takeaway for the groundwater recharge projects is that we get low base flow returns continuously throughout the year and that is going to continue for years and decades to come. So I think that is it. Any questions? You can, if you have any questions, you can email me. We've got the program website and the, the Headwaters Corporation website. Yes? We have just, in this year, we have constructed a pilot scale recapture well project um, with the intent, and so we had one existing recapture well, and now we've added seven more, and the intent is that we can, you know, again, to accelerate those returns and to target them to the river during periods of shortage when they're needed, so we can, we can pump uh, during those times, and we, once those wells became operational in the spring, we basically pumped the hell out of them all summer, except for during that time that we were running the EA release. Yes. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if I can. Um, you basically, uh, the program has a science plan, and you know there are various uh, hypotheses that they are testing related to species impacts, species benefits. If we do this, does it help the species in such and such a way? And they actually went through an entire adaptive management cycle, and we are now in the extension on our um, second, I guess, iteration of, of, adapt of the adaptive management cycle. But it, it's basically a means of, you know, testing things, determining if they work, and if they don't work, we, we can change course. Yes. Uh, no bypass infrastructure. The water is administered by the Nebraska Department of Natural Resources. Uh, when we make those EA releases, that water is allowed to pass through. So that with the power and irrigation system, there's, there's one big canal that, that diverts directly below Lake McConaughey, and then there's another one that diverts directly below the city of North Platte. And that environmental account water is allowed to pass through both of those canals because the end return point is upstream of the associated habitat reach. So um, EA water, it can go down the North Platte River if the canals are full, but uh, generally speaking, it's given priority to, to be routed through those canals and used for hydropower generation on its way down um, to the habitat reach. And those, those power districts are required to return all of it minus any appropriate transit losses. Yes. I 
don't. Yeah, not that I'm aware of. Um, our our focus is, I mean, you know, the, the whooping cranes sort of end up migrating amongst the, the tens or hundreds of thousands of sandhill cranes that pass through the Great Plains. Uh, so our focus is pretty much exclusively. What's that? Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, and so you know the piece that I didn't talk about was the the land aspect and the habitat aspect. So the program has acquired over 13,000 acre feet of land in the Central Platte, and the idea is in also in coordinating with uh, other conservation organizations that we've created these habitat complexes, and it's basically the the goal is to have one between every bridge segment along the South Platte River. So you have you know bridges at Overton and Elm Creek and Lexington and Kearney and all that. So this habitat, and as part of those habitat restorations, you know, they clear a lot of the riparian forest and create those wide open spaces that are uh, hopefully favorable to the whooping cranes for, you know, for landing and roosting there, as opposed to being, you know, heavily wooded riparian corridor. Yes. I knew someone was going to ask. <laughs> we are basically trying to stay out of it <laughs> right now. You know, early on, they, they kept trying to invoke that it was going to have benefits for the program and whatnot, and we're kind of like, just keep us out of it for the time being. We, re we really, it, you know, it's still in conceptual stages. We have no idea um, really what the impacts would be, but presumably any impacts, any uh, you know, depletive effects to the river would have to be mitigated under Nebraska's new depletion plan. Uh, but again, it, it sort of remains to be seen how that, uh, how that shapes up and, and we are, are not actively engaging with it as a program. Yes. We are primarily funded through the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, I forget the percentages exactly, uh, but the Bureau of Reclamation provides the largest cash contribution. The state of Colorado provides cash contribution. And then Wyoming and Nebraska's contributions are prob primarily in-kind contributions of water uh, through the storage in those environmental accounts. Um, we get it for free. At least the, the, the water that accrues directly to the Pathfinder EA and the 10% of winter inflows to the Lake McConaughey environmental account. Any other questions? All right, thank you, everyone. just a couple minutes left in this session. And I wonder if anybody, since we had to rush with our first uh, group on reservoirs, if anyone has questions for them, um, they are still here and available to answer questions if we have them. <laughs> my, my question is for April, who's right in front of me, which is why I do not need <laughs> the microphone. Um, was there any recommendations about the ramping of releases from Rudai? Yeah, so the um, CPW requests that the Bureau try to control those, re do those releases in 25 um, CFS increments each day. And so when they do need to go up um, 100 or 150 CFS, they try to do that they try to step it up. It doesn't always work that way. You know, the complications come with like someone has to physically go to the reservoir, crank it. Um, and so they come from like Denver and, uh, you know, four hour drive to like crank it and come back the next day. And, you know, so like there's odd things that get in the way of making real things happen. So, yeah, but good question. Thanks.
All right, well, let's give another round of applause. Thank you to our speakers. I think we have a little break right now. Um, so thanks, everyone. <laughs>